民警，听起来就是非常精彩的内容，请各位有空去看一下。所以有遗失任何物品的，请到咨询处找领。那请不要利用标示禁止进入的出入口。我们在演讲开始之后，我们都会只剩下一个出入口能够进出。谢谢各位配合。那所以各位在这边的都是真正的男子汉跟女中英豪，因为我们要讨论的是这个 kernel space 的城市设计。啊、哦，那些想象你在写日志 space code 会有这个 segmentation fault， 就是还能够有 core down 保护的，那你就来错地方了。这样子，我们都知道说，一九九一年的时候，有一个芬兰大学生，他写了一封信到 Minix 的这个 user group。那他信里面的内容这样讲，他说 ，Do you pine for the old, for the good old days of Minix 1.1 when men were men and wrote their own device drivers？ 你会不会很想念 Minix 1.1 的那个美好古老时光？那时候，男人还是真正的男子汉呢，自己用到的驱动程式都是自己写的。<笑>啊，如果你还怀念这样的美好时光的话，就来参加我新写的这个 Linux 的 project 这样子。那是一九九一年，到现在已经二十年了。所以今天我们非常荣幸的请到 LWN.net 的创办者，呃 ，Jonathan Corbett 先生来跟我们讲这二十年来 Linux kernel 开发的经过，还有 Linux kernel 最新开发的近况。Jonathan Corbett 先生他的 LWN.net 的网站。是我个人在 Linux 上面开发产品，开发尤其是 kernel 里面的 driver 的部分。如果你想知道最新 API 的进展，或者开发 Linux kernel 底下出错，到底要怎么做比较有效，我认为它是那还是最好的资讯来源。所以如果说你还没有订阅 LWN d n e t 的话，请各位一定非常值得花那个只需要美金的钱去订阅它。那现在请各位给热烈掌声欢迎 Jonathan Corbett。All right. Well, thank you all for for coming to to listen to me talk about the kernel. I have just come from、um, straight from the LinuxCon event in Vancouver, which is all about the 20th anniversary of Linux. So when people talk about 20 years, they're talking about the period from October or sorry August 25th, 1991, when Linus Torvalds first posted a message to the Linux list saying, "I'm working on a free operating system." Up to the present, period of almost exactly 20 years now that we have been working on the Linux kernel. But as I come here to talk about those 20 years and beyond, one of the things I wish to point out is that, in fact, the history is much longer than 20 years. That Linux did not just magically appear out of the void in some sort of quantum event. That there were things that came before it. So I would like to look at what. Led up to the creation of Linux, what created the environment that made Linux possible? But of course, that leads to a whole different question of where do you start? Because one could look at the history of Unix, and I could talk for an hour about that and not come close to covering the whole thing. Or one could go back to its predecessor, which is Multics, or to very early computing like Fortran, or even earlier than that with something like Babbage's Difference Engine. Uh, which is mechanical computing and so on, or even earlier than that, if one wanted to. But I picked a different starting date for what I think of as being the beginning of the free Unix era, and the date that I picked is 1976, which is the publication of a book called Lyons' Commentary on Unix. Lyons, John Lyons, was a professor in Australia, and he took his copy of the Unix source code. And printed it into a book with a great deal of commentary about how this code actually worked. It was the first time that students or people without access to the Unix source, which is most people in those days, could actually look at a description of how an operating system works alongside the actual source code, which implemented that operating system. It allowed a discussion of how operating systems work that was different than what came before. And open things up in a way that they were not open before. It was an important moment, and this this book was considered valuable enough that people would make photocopies of it and spread it around and give it to their friends, and so on. And it was distributed as an underground thing because it could not be legally published until I think about ten years ago, when finally the the Unix license holder said that this book could actually be legally published. Um, around the world, until then, you couldn't actually get it unless you got a copy that was photocopied from somebody. If you go about ten years, actually about nine years after that, 
An important date, obviously, is in 1985, when Richard Stallman published the GNU Manifesto. And if you haven't read it, it's worth reading. It's sort of amusing in a number of ways, especially, for example, in the context of the booths upstairs where they're trying very hard to hire computer programmers. One of the things that Richard Stallman thought would happen as a result of the creation of a free operating system was that the salary of programmers would go way down and programmers would become very cheap to hire. Um, has not worked that way. But Richard laid out this vision of an entirely free operating system that not only could we build a free operating system, but that we really had to, that it was something that we needed to do to be able to live freely in the world. And people thought that it was funny, that it was an overly ambitious goal, that it was not something that we could possibly achieve back in those days. But we did achieve it. And one of the real reasons why we did achieve it is because he set out this vision. And even those of us who do not agree with him on all things, which is most of us perhaps, have to give him credit for having set things going in the direction that we're going and having created the philosophical underpinnings that have made it possible in the way that it was possible. Another important date came in 1988 with the formation of the MIT-X Consortium. The X Consortium was created by a group of companies in the United States that wanted to create a desktop environment for Unix workstations that, was, that would compete with Sun's SunView, which was really the dominant windowing environment for Unix systems at that time. And they decided to do it by creating a common code base which would be released under a free license, it was under a permissive license, that they would all contribute to and they would all then build their own products from. It was, I think, about the first time that a number of companies came together in a commercial setting to build a common resource as free software like this. X did a lot of things right, they did a lot of things wrong, but we were still running it on all of our Linux systems now and will be for a little while yet, I think. Wayland hasn't taken over the world yet. And they, they, they showed that this can work, and in fact it has worked very well. And all of these things set the environment that, that Linux came into back 20 years ago. Now the actual first release of the Linux kernel came out in September of 1991, a little bit after Linus posted his message. This was actually a pretty tiny core of code. You can still go out on, into the archives and download this release. It's worth looking at. It's about 10,000 lines of code, which is smaller than a medium-sized Linux device driver now. It didn't do very much. It did not work very well. But the key thing that Linus understood was that it didn't have to. If it got far enough that people could play with it and they would be motivated to make it better, then they would do so, and in fact, they did. All right. This was followed in December. We got up to version 0 0.11. This was the first version of Linux that could actually build itself. Until then, you needed a separate system, a Minix system, to build Linux on, then put it on your, your target system. Now it was actually self-hosted. It could build itself. A couple months after that, we came out with version 0 0.12 in February of 1992. It added a number of useful features that people expect to have, but this was the first version of the Linux kernel that was licensed under the general public license. Prior to this, Linus had actually used a, his own homebrew, non-commercial use license. So the, the change of license was an important step in the development of Linux. Had it remained under a non-commercial use license, we would not be here today talking about it, I don't think. Uh, had it gone under a permissive license, like a BSD license, I don't know what would have come of it. I think the history would have been different. But in any case, he chose the GPL with the various requirements that come with it. And that has, has set the environment in which Linux has developed ever since then. Only one month later, we went from 0 0.12 to 0 0.95, all in one jump. The reason and there were a couple of reasons for this big version number jump. This was the first version that could run X. It was the first version of Linux that had a graphical environment. But it was also the point where they said, okay, we think that we are very close to a 1.0 release. The kernel is getting good enough that we can call it 1.0. They thought this in March of 1992. It would be very soon. In fact, it took two years. <laughs> 
<laughs> this would not be the last time that we didn't quite meet our release deadlines. Uh, but a lot of things happened in those two years, including the addition of networking support. Because even back in 1992, it was pretty clear that a system that couldn't talk to the internet would not be particularly useful in the long run. So between 0 0.95 and 1.0, the, the volume of the source code grew by a factor of about 7 to almost 200,000 lines of code now in March of 1994. So a lot of stuff happened in that period of time between when they thought 1.0 was ready and when it actually became ready. So one year after that, we had 1.2. This was the first version of the kernel that ran on other architectures. It was not just limited to the x86 architecture. In fact, with the alpha port, Linux became one of the first kernels out there to have proper 64-bit support in it back in 1995. They also added a credits file. They actually did that back in 1.0, where we had 80 names, 80 people who had been listed as having contributed to Linux. By the time we got to 1.2, we were up to 128 names now, 128 developers who had contributed to the Linux kernel, which is a pretty good number of developers, but is pretty small compared to what was to follow. All right, jump forward now to 1996, June of 1996. The 2.0 kernel came out. In many ways, this was the first version of the kernel that was really usable in a lot of settings. Among other things, it added multiprocessor support, which was considered to be kind of a big iron, high-end computing feature back in those days. It didn't work all that well. It really only worked with two processors at that point, but you had to start somewhere, and that was where we started. It's also sort of discouragingly in indicative of how things have gone that it was only at this point that the developers thought there was value in adding a directory to hold documentation. Before then, um, there was none. So we settled into a pattern after this uh, that we'll see here. 2.2 came out in 1999. It was almost three years later. We start to see the period between the releases growing. It's something I will come back to. And we get into a period where what we're mainly doing is we're adding support for more hardware and trying to increase the scalability because only supporting two processors did not really work very well. Only supporting less than one gigabyte of memory did not really work very well. Things were growing, so the kernel had to support, had to grow with it to support these things. So 2.2 added a lot of scalability features and also added the first support for the IPv6 network protocol, which someday soon we're actually going to start using when things. All right, a couple years after that, 2.4 comes out, more hardware support, more scalability, and um, support for mainframe computers went in in 2.4. Jump forward three more years, pretty much exactly three years actually, and we get to 2.6 at the end, the very end of 2003 with more hardware support, more scalability, user mode Linux, which was the first virtualization technology that went into Linux. It's not something that's used heavily now, but it was where we started with virtualization. And we're now up to almost 450 names in the credits file, 450 people who are listed as having contributed to the Linux kernel. What came after then changed a little bit. We had a, a series of releases all in the first half of 2004, one right after the other. The first couple of them, 261, 262, were simply bug fix releases. But after that, we started adding new features to the kernel in a way that was different than what came before. And I will come back to, to how that uh, worked in a little bit. But I stopped at this point listing every single release because things changed and because I simply ran out of room for all the arrows. But if you look at what has happened through to the present, we have been producing releases at a rate of about five kernel releases every year, plus or minus. And that has been going quite steadily right up to the present, up to the 3.0 kernel, which is the current kernel, it was released just last month. So we've gone from something that was fairly erratic to a very regular clock light release cycle. And how we got there is actually going to be the topic of a fair amount of the talk. But first of all, I wanted to put up one other little 
plot here, this is the number of lines of code in the kernel source tree over time. So we started with 10,000 lines of code back in 1991. We now have more than 14 million lines of code in 2011. And we've gone very steadily upwards with a slowly increasing pace over time, with one interesting little exception, which is 2636, which as far as I know is the only kernel we ever released that was smaller than the one that came before it. That was the result of a bunch of cleanup work that was done in that kernel. Often the most valuable work you can do is actually removing code, and a lot of it was done there. So we got a little bit smaller, but that has only happened once, and I don't expect it to happen again anytime soon. So that's where we are. But how we got there is an interesting story. So I'm going to tell just some pieces of it and then uh, look towards the future after that. So if we go back to this timeline and we look here around September of 1998, Linus released a development kernel during that time which did not build for anybody. It did not compile. And the reason for that was that he had failed to properly merge a patch that one of the developers had sent to him. This led to a lot of very angry email on the mailing list because there had in fact been a lot of trouble with getting code into the kernel and developers were very frustrated. This argument went on for a few days and ended in this way where Linus posted this message saying you guys are just adding the pressure to me go away I am going on vacation get out of my mailbox I am leaving. It was a bad day. It looked really like perhaps the end of everything that we had been working for at this point. And there were people who were really wondering if we were going to have to fork the kernel project to, um, to address the problems that were making people unhappy. We didn't, in fact, fork the kernel. We managed to get past it. Linus came back from his vacation uh, in a calmer state of mind and we were able to get on. But these things happened again with great regularity. It happened again in 2002, there was a big blow up, and in 2000 and so on. And what we kept hearing every time was that Linus does not scale. The kernel is getting bigger, the community is getting bigger, but he is still just one person and is not getting bigger with it. So this was a big problem and it is worth talking about why it is that this was a problem. So let's talk about how kernels were made once upon a time. If you were a kernel developer, you would do some work and you would create a patch. And these patches, the way you would get them into the kernel was to email them to Linus. And then they would pile up in his mailbox. They would pile up very deep in his mailbox. Then at some point, Linus was supposed to come along and work through all this mail. <laughs> And he would produce one big patch that contained everything that he had decided to accept into the kernel. At this point, all of the, the information regarding the individual changes had been lost. There were no change logs. There was no authorship information. There was nothing. There was just one big patch that he would release. And he would say, here is the next development kernel. So this was bad enough, but it was made worse by the fact that often as not, he would just get busy, he would get overwhelmed, he would get tired, and a lot of stuff would simply be deleted without being considered or um, responded to in any way. If you were a kernel developer, if you sent in a patch and you wanted to see it here, you would have to read that diff file and look to see if your particular changes had gone into the kernel or not, and if not, you would have to send them again. And it was a quite common experience to have to send the patch several times to Linus before he would either finally put it into the kernel or tell you that he was not going to. So this, this was a problem in a lot of ways. It didn't work very well. And you can imagine that a process like this might work back in the early days when you have half a dozen developers. By the time we were in 1998 and we had several dozen developers, it was not working very well at all. What we have now is thousands of developers, and this could not possibly work. So something had to change, and there were a couple of things that changed. Back in 1998, when this first blow up I described happened, I got a phone call from a guy named Larry McVoy, who had an idea for a different kind of version control system that would better match the way that, that Linux was developed. It would allow for distributed repositories 
developers to work independently and for patches to filter their way upwards through maintainers and get to Linus and take a whole lot of the load off of his shoulders. It seemed like a nice idea, but it took about two and a half, almost three years before BitKeeper was ready for this role and before Linus was actually ready to try it. It took a long time to convince him to, that we wanted to use a version control system. So it was only here in 2001, at the beginning of the 2.5 development cycle, that he actually tried it. And everything changed almost overnight. All of a sudden we had a way to get changes into the kernel that, that actually worked smoothly and people started to use it and the process shaped up in a big way very quickly. There were a lot of advantages to BitKeeper. It was really the first distributed version control system that was out there and that did in fact work very well with the way that the kernel community worked. Allowed maintainers to manage their own subsystems and to just send up to Linus stuff that was really truly ready to go into the kernel. The problems we used to have with patches being dropped on the floor pretty much went away and we finally were able to actually track the changes going into the kernel and keep the authorship information and the change log information and so on. It's really pretty amazing to think that in 2004 we didn't have that. We still didn't have that information in such an important development project. So all this went in, but of course BitKeeper had a problem or two. The main one being that it was not free software. It was a proprietary package that was released under a, a particular license written by Larry McVoy that tried to address his own concerns as he tried to turn BitKeeper into a commercial project. This license tended to change over time as people did things that Larry didn't like. He would update the license and say, no, you cannot do this sort of thing. You could not use BitKeeper, for example, if you worked at a company that worked on version control as a product in any way, things like that. It became known after time as the Don't Piss Off Larry license because um, every time he got angry, something would change. And that led to lots of flame wars on the mailing list. People who didn't like the use of a, of a non-free tool with the kernel, people who didn't like the license, and so on. And there were battles and f flame wars and fights, and it went on for a long time. At one point, Linus tried to stop these flame wars by posting a thing saying, yes, I would prefer to use a free tool, but there isn't one. And as he put it, since he was not personally interested in writing a version control tool, he was going to use the one that actually existed. Sort of a, a prescient statement in a way, since of course he did end up writing a version control tool. That happened in 2005 when somebody did in fact piss off Larry in the wrong way and overnight the BitKeeper license was <clears throat> withdrawn and the tool that had become such an important part of our development process simply disappeared overnight. This is always a problem with non-free software. You just, you do not know what is going to happen to it. You do not have that control. And so it vanished. It was about a week later that Linus actually wrote a version control tool and posted the first version of Git and by the end of the year, we had seen the Git 1.0 release. Git, of course, has become a highly successful software development project in its own right. It is used well beyond the kernel community and has spawned a whole set of industries or a whole set of businesses on its own. But it has also helped to stabilize kernel development. It was even better than BitKeeper. and is a good part of why we now have such a nice regular development process that we did not have before. So does Linus scale now? Well, if you look at the period of just over a year now, since the beginning of the 2636 development cycle, during this time we have made five kernel releases and we have another one actually pretty well underway at this point. During this time, over 57,000 change sets have been merged into the kernel. That's something like 150 changes going into the kernel every single day. Just try to do that through somebody's email mailbox. It would not have worked. All right, and 3,000, more than 3,000 developers have contributed to the kernel over the course of the last year, adding about 1.3 million lines of code in one year. All right, remember the 2.0 kernel was less than 1 million lines of code. We're adding more than a 2.0 kernel just over the course of the last year.
And during this whole time, Linus now seems quite relaxed. During the last merge window, he actually went diving on a vacation while, while he was pulling stuff into the kernel, and it didn't seem to interfere with his vacationing at all. In fact, we seem to, I think we're at a point where we have to find something else for him to do, because it has gotten too easy for him. <laughs> so it has really, it has transformed the process quite well, and things work very well. But to get to where we are now, there's a couple of other things we had to deal with. If we go back to now, just towards the end of 1999, when we had the 2.0 feature freeze, this is when Lena said, okay, sorry, not 2.0, 2.4. We're going to have the 2.4 kernel release coming out now. Time to freeze the features. We will add no new features to the kernel. We'll just add fixes. You'll notice it took about a year and a half before we actually got a 2.4 kernel after that. And in fact, 2.4 was not useful for most of 2001 until a bunch of other stuff came in. The 2.6.0 release instead didn't happen until almost 2004. It's a period of about four years. And the reason that I point out this period is that any change that was not ready when the 2.4 feature freeze happened would, by the rules, not actually make it into a stable kernel release until 2.6.0 came out. So if you were writing a device driver or something interesting that wasn't quite ready in 1999 when, when the 2.4 feature freeze hit, it would have to wait until the development cycle and could not come out until almost 2004. It's a period of four years when any new features written could not get out to, to the world. That, of course, does not work very well in an industry that moves as quickly as our industry moves. And it led to a great deal of frustration. It led to a lot of problems. A lot of patches that were simply lost because developers got frustrated about getting them into the kernel and just gave up. Um, the feature freezes, in fact, didn't work very well. If you look back here, I pointed out that it took a long time between the feature freeze and the actual kernel release. And the reason for that was that the feature freeze did not stay very frozen. Linus would let up and start to let stuff in and things would destabilize again. And then we would try to freeze things again. It was, it was really a problem. If you look at the kernels that distributors were releasing in those days, they would take a 2.4 kernel. Then they would pick the 2.6 features that they thought that their users wanted and backport them into the 2.4 kernel and release something that had literally thousands of patches added to it on top of what the mainline had. So every distributor was really maintaining their own fork of the kernel. It was different from what the community was doing and different from what every other distributor had. Um, was not tested anywhere near as widely. It was, it was a bad thing all around. And we had a lot of quality problems in those days, trying to get the kernel to where it actually worked and to where it was really solid. So things were not really working right, but we didn't quite know how to fix it. And in fact, even in the middle of 2004, when the kernel developers came together for the 2004 kernel summit, we, we went into a session with the idea that we would name a maintainer for the 2.6 kernel and decide what was going to happen with the 2.7 development series. The, the result of that, of that discussion surprised everybody. Nobody expected it. But what we came out with was that there would be no 2.7 development cycle. Then instead, we were going to change the way we made kernel releases so that we would, put, we would make the releases very quickly and that every single one of them would be a feature release, would be a major release with new features, with uh, disruptive changes, and so on. So we started doing that after that release. And as you can see, we have been doing it ever since, where we have abandoned the old development cycle that led to very long periods of time between releases. And we now get releases out to users much more quickly. Uh, at the time, that change was quite controversial. At this point, I don't think there is anybody who would like to go back to the way that we used to do it because it didn't work very well at all compared to what we have now. There are a few other little changes that we had to make to get there. We added the stable tree, which is a, it's just a separate repository to collect patches for the stable releases for a period of time after they have gone out. It's just a way of further stabilizing the releases for a short period of time or sometimes for a longer period of time. The 2.6.32 release, which came out in 2009, 
is still getting stable updates in the stable tree, even though many other kernels during that time are not, just because some of the enterprise distributors have based releases on it. It was another year and another kernel summit before we added the, the merge window rule. The merge window is the rule that says for every development cycle, the first two weeks is the period in which new features and other big changes are added. After the merge window closes, the only thing that's supposed to be added to the kernel are fixes to try to stabilize things. And before that time, we actually didn't have that rule. We just had this vague idea that things should calm down towards the end of the development cycle. It took a little while for the dis discipline to really set in, but it's, it is now quite strong and it has helped a lot. We now have much higher quality kernel releases than we used to have back in those days. And then in 2008, we added the, the Linux Next repository, which is a separate tree for the integration of patches for the next kernel release, not the one that is actually being worked on right now. It's a way of finding integration problems between different changes and to do some early testing and has once again helped us to produce more stable kernels in a quicker and more predictable sort of way. And that there in 2008 is really the last significant change that we have made to the development process. And as you can see, it is working quite smoothly. We're producing about five releases a year. Every release has approximately 10,000 changes in it. About 1,000 developers contribute to every one of them. And the whole thing works as smoothly as a greased wheel. It's really working very well at the moment. And that's where we stand. A couple of other history things that are worth looking at, though, before I move into the future. I want to talk a little bit about the business of Linux, because it is important with regard to the development community. I could do a whole talk on this, of course, but don't have time for that. If you look back, you know, 1991 was our first release. By 1992, we actually had people creating businesses around the Linux kernel starting with um, soft landing software, which is the first distribution. SUSE was formed in 1992. Red Hat instead was not actually created until 1994. They're the, the youngsters in this community at this point. Um, but every, everybody at that stage was pretty much in the distribution business. By the time we got to 1998, Red Hat had developed to the point where it could actually start hiring kernel developers. So in 1998, about April or so, Alan Cox, a major developer, took a job at Red Hat. He was probably not the first kernel developer to be paid to work on the kernel, but I believe he was the first high-profile developer to get a job working on the kernel full-time. It took that long to get to the point where, where the the economic e ecosystem could support that with, with Linux. People were very worried at that time that having developers like Alan going to work for companies would distort their priorities and perhaps give these companies too much control over the way Linux was developed. At this point, people don't really worry about that so much, but it was a concern then. Later that same year was when Intel made an investment in Red Hat. That would not be big news now, of course, but it was huge news then. Back in 1998, Linux was still very much trying to, to establish its legitimacy. It still looked like a toy system to a lot of people. A lot of companies didn't see that they could base their products or their, or their processes on it. It didn't look like anything that was real. When Intel came and put its money into its development, into the companies that were behind it, it became clear to a whole lot more people that Linux was actually real, that it was going to go somewhere. So that was a big moment in, in Linux history. It was only a year after that that VA Linux Systems had its initial public offering of stock. The, the price of that stock went up by a factor of 10 on the, the first day of trading. This was in fact considered to be the, the high point of the entire dot-com bubble in, at the end of 2000. It was sort of the, the high point of the folly there. And it wasn't much after that that we saw the dot-com crash. There were a number of other Linux companies that were supposed to go public then. How many of you have heard of a company called Linux Care? Not very many. Linux Care was a Linux support company. It was supposed to be a really big public offering. It was supposed to be the most successful Linux company of them all. 
but in fact they did not even succeed in going public and that company has since failed. A number of other companies failed in these years. Other companies laid off their developers who then some of them disappeared from the community. This was a really sort of unpleasant time in, for people working in the, in the business of Linux. It was a difficult time. But I wish to point something out. This is the same plot that I put up before of the number of lines in the Linux kernel, right? This is the period of time that I'm talking about right here. And if you look at that, you see that the rate of development of the kernel, the, the rate of growth of the kernel at least, did not change during that time. It did not slow down at all. For all that the businesses around Linux were having trouble, the, the development was going on as strongly as ever during that time. It did not falter even a little bit and has not faltered since, even with everything else that has happened up and down. One other thing about the business of Linux, back, this is in 2007 now, I read one article too many that said that nobody should be using Linux, especially in business, because it is just a toy system that is produced by hobbyists working in their parents' basement and so on. It's not actually a serious professional sort of a product. So I actually did a study. I went into the Git repository because we had a couple of years of history at that point and looked at where the changes going to the kernel were coming from. And the numbers they came up with looked a lot like this. These are actually more recent numbers. This is for the last year of development again, that same period since the beginning of the 2636 development series. So if you see about 15% of the changes going into the kernel come from people who are working on their own time. Everybody else putting code into Linux is working for somebody who is paying them to do that work. All right. By far, the vast majority of the code going into Linux comes from companies that are, um, that are contributing to it, not because they think it's a good cause that they want to support, but because they see it in their own economic interest to support the development of the Linux kernel. So a lot of these companies aren't a surprise, companies like Red Hat and Intel. One of the biggest changes I've seen in more recent times is that we're seeing companies like Texas Instruments or Samsung adding code into the kernel. We're seeing the, the embedded industry, which for a long time kept its changes away from the kernel, has now come around to actually contributing to the kernel. That has created opportunities and problems and so on, but it is really a, um, a big change and an important one. Now if I could just see a couple of other, say, Taiwan-based businesses here, um, we would all be much happier yet um, see some of the other companies that, that work with Linux contribute to it and help to take it forward and to drive it in the direction that they want it to go. But the, the indications are all very good. Things are going in a very good direction. And we have a very healthy development community here. Typically over 300 different companies contributed to the kernel over the course of any one year that you would look at. There's a lot going on. I was speaking about embedded Linux. I wanted to see what the first embedded Linux product was out there. And I don't know that I got a definitive answer, but Wikipedia tells me that it was the Axis 2100 camera. And if it's in Wikipedia, it must absolutely be true. So, <laughs> um, so I will accept it as true. I actually had one of those cameras. That's what it looked like. Um, in those days. It was just a camera with an Ethernet port on the back. It had a web server built into it, so you could just plug it on directly onto the net and look at what was on there. Pretty common sort of thing now, but it was, it was an interesting product at that time, and it is arguably the first product that actually had Linux built into it. Since then, of course, there are a whole lot more of them that have come out. I can't even begin to talk about all of those. So I just, I picked out two other interesting dates that I th thought were worth mentioning with regard to embedded Linux. By the end of 2003, the business of, of home-based routers running Linux was very well established and there were a lot of them. The business of, of releasing the source as required by the GPL was perhaps not quite as well advanced in that area at that time. But a number of people worked very hard for a long time and managed to get Linksys to release the source for the kernel for its WRT54G router. You know, just a little household router that you would have in your home. Since then, we've seen an explosion of Linux distributions based around this initial release. 
a whole bunch of distributions that you can put onto a router and, and do all kinds of very interesting things with. It's an interesting set of gadgets at this point. And I think that if you were to go to, to Linksys and ask them, was it a good thing that you had to release that source for the router? They would have to say yes, because they have sold millions of routers to people who wanted to put their own versions of the, of the Linux router software on there. The other date worth pointing out towards the end of 2008 is when we saw the first Android phone released. It was, of course, not the first phone handset to run Linux. Those had been coming out for a few years at that point. But Android has certainly transformed the industry around Linux-based handsets and hopefully help to create a, a more open industry, even if it is not as open as we would like it to be, and has um, done a whole lot of very interesting things. And much else has happened, of course, in the area of embedded Linux during this time. I could do a whole talk on that. But um, I don't have the time for that. I really only have time for one other thing in my history lesson here, which is 2003, in March of 2003, when a company called the SCO Group filed suit against IBM saying that the Linux kernel contained millions of lines of their code that had been copied from them, and they wanted billions of dollars in attacks on Linux and all that sort of stuff. They created a huge cloud over Linux for about one year before people figured out that there wasn't much to it. The thing that I would like to do is I would like to say thank you to the SCO group because I believe they did us a lot of good in a lot of ways, even if that was not what they wanted to do. Right. The SCO group brought about a very close inspection of the Linux kernel source code, looking very hard for any kind of code that was not legitimately there, that had been copied from somewhere else. They had millions of dollars that they were able to put into this effort of trying to find illegitimate code in the Linux kernel, and they found nothing, nothing at all. They proved in a way that we in the community never could have that that our code is clean, that it comes from proper sources, that it comes from people who are properly authorized to contribute it, and that all of the people who said that running Linux might be dangerous because you don't know where the source code came from did not know what they were talking about. They proved that in a way that we could never have done. Um, they taught us that what we had made was valuable enough that people would try to steal it. And um, as a result, we now have better legal resources, we have better processes internally, and so on. We are better prepared to defend against such attacks in the future. But I don't believe we will ever see an attack like that again based on copyright. Nobody will come along and say, our copyrighted code has been stolen by the kernel, unless they are really, really very sure of what they are saying. I wish I could say the same about patents. Alas, that's a separate sort of issue. But in terms of copyright-based attacks, those are done. I don't think we'll ever see that again. Um, a, a clever attacker might have done us a whole lot of damage, but um, that is not what happened here. The SCO group made us stronger. So that is how we got to where we are. In the, the short time that I have left, I will try to talk a little bit about where we're going. Of course, making predictions is a hard thing to do. Um, you tend to look kind of silly in the future when you do that. So um, there are limits to what I can do. But one prediction is really easy to make. Because we have such a predictable development process now, I can say that right around the end of September or the beginning of October is when the 3.1 kernel will be released. The merge window for this kernel is closed, so we know what changes will be in it. These include a lot of improvements to the Zen virtualization subsystem. It's only in the 3.0 kernel that we got a lot of the Zen code into the kernel. It had been outside of the mainline tree for a long time. Now that it's there, people can improve it, and we are seeing a lot of improvements going in. Also, in 3.1, we'll see improvements to the IP set firewalling mechanism. We have support for a whole new CPU architecture in 3.1. This architecture is called Open Risk. It's actually an open source hardware design. You can get the masks and so on. And if you happen to have a chip fab in your basement, you can make your own processors. Um, I believe people will try to make products around that. But we have support for that processor in the kernel now. We got support for near-field communications in a generic way so you can 
um, buy things at point of sale terminals with a suitably equipped handset, things like that. Improvements to the software RAID subsystem and a whole bunch of other stuff went into the kernel for 3.1. Once again, we'll see about 10,000 changes going into the kernel for this release, which will happen in, at, around the end of next month. But that, that's short-term stuff. We're talking about 20 years in the past. You know, what could happen 20 years in the future? And that, of course, is very hard to say. So what I'm going to say is going to be pretty much vague in general. But um, there are a few things to be said. Andrew Morton, of course, is one of the, the top-level kernel developers, one of the, the high-tier developers in our process. Back in 1995, he said famous last words, but the actual volume of patches has to drop off one of these days. This was during the 2614 development cycle when we merged about 4,000 changes. Now we merge about 10,000 changes for every development cycle. So the volume did not drop off. In fact, it has grown by a factor of two or three since then. So I don't think it's going to drop off anytime soon for the simple reason that the hardware will continue to evolve. Things are going to change. We're going to have all kinds of interesting stuff we have to deal with. The applications will continue to evolve and what users want will continue to evolve. So as long as people keep on using Linux, I believe that we will have work to do. I think the kernel is going to continue to develop for a long, long time. It's going to stay busy. That, of course, leads to an interesting question, which is, what if the patch volume grows even more? What if um, we have way more changes than we do now? How scalable is Linus now? Are we going to run into trouble again with, with the development process? And perhaps even more importantly, are we able to review all of these changes? Because in theory, every change going into the kernel has been looked at by other developers and reviewed and the problems in it fixed. We're not always as good as I would like us to be about reviewing code because it's hard to find people to do that work. Every open source development project, I believe, has this problem. Review is a chronically scarce resource in development projects, much more so than the actual creation of the code, is the review of the code. Anyway, that, that's a problem. Scalability is a problem. At some point, I expect that we're going to run into trouble where the development process stutters again, and we're going to have to make changes to it. This has happened in the past. It'll happen again in the future. We have dealt with it. I am not too worried about it. It's just the way things go. Related problem. This is a picture from the 2010 Kernel Summit held last November in Cambridge in the United States. If you look at these guys as well as you can with this projector, you'll notice that quite a few of them are getting kind of gray up on top. <laughs> That's the ones who still have their hair. Um, <laughs> A lot of these developers started working on Linux 10 years or so or more when, when things were open and there were a lot of opportunities. They have become the top level maintainers for the Linux kernel and um, they don't appear to be going anywhere because it's a very nice place to be. This leads to the question of do we have a place for the young new hotshot developers who are going to create the interesting changes for the next 20 years. I am not too worried about it yet. The evidence seems to be that these people can find a place for themselves. But it is something to keep an eye on because a lot of these guys, gray or not, are not going to be going anywhere for quite a while yet. So we're going to have to pay attention to that. We may need them though because the code is getting more complex over time. The 3.0 re release was delayed partially because of a very subtle bug that it took the combined resources of about four of our top developers, including Linus, a few days to try to figure out what was going on and how to fix it properly. Some parts of the kernel are very tricky, very complicated, very hard to understand. And I think that's going to provide a, it's going to make the ongoing maintenance harder and it's going to make it harder to bring new developers into the kernel because it can be very off-putting if you get into certain parts of the kernel. It's something that we're going to have to watch. Really, any, div any project as it gets bigger is going to have that kind of challenge. Related challenge is hardware complexity. Computers used to be relatively simple. If you look at a functional diagram for a typical system on chip now, you realize that, in fact, the hardware has gotten a whole lot more complicated. This, this is 
a CPU, but you see four ARM processors powered into it right there, plus things like the GPU and all these other subsystems that are on it. They are all tied together in very interesting ways. They have access to memory and so on. It leads to a level of complexity that we did not have in older CPUs. And that complexity is necessarily going to be reflected in the software, which is going to have to get more complex to handle more complex hardware. And there's just a lot of things that we're going to have to deal with there. Some of this has shown itself recently with the, the architecture subtree for the ARM architecture, which has become a big complicated mess and it's something that we're going to have to clean up over the next couple of years. It's going to be a bit of a problem. But um, that, that's just life. I don't see that trend going anywhere anytime soon. But the real problem with hardware is the one that we've always been facing, which is the actual full access to our hardware, the hardware that we think we bought, that we own, is going to be a constant battle because there are people and there are companies that wish to use control of the hardware as a way to control the software and to control the markets that go around that sort of stuff as well. This is something we've been fighting for years. We've been fighting it very successfully and things have gotten better, but it's going to continue to be a challenge. It's going to be a, a battle we're going to have to continue to fight for a long time. Another challenge, this is a 20 year challenge for sure, is security. I worry that in the kernel community we don't think about security often enough and there's a whole industry around security that just doesn't help out there based on finding exploits and posting them and that sort of stuff. So we're seeing some encouraging things happening in the kernel and there are people who are putting more effort into security. But it's going to be hard and the reason that it's going to be hard is the environment is changing. And in the next 20 years we are going to see an increasing number of attacks from groups that have the resources of national governments. If you look at the Stuxnet worm as a classic example of um, what I'm talking about, or if you look at the attacks on, on Google in mainland China, if you look at what happened in Egypt there with, with the shutdowns of the internet and so on, there is a battle for control that is going on. And the people who are fighting this battle are very well funded and very sharp. And I have no idea, honestly, how we create a software stack, including a kernel, that is really resilient against that level of attack. But as we have these systems in our pockets, perhaps eventually implanted in our bodies for, as pacemakers or something initially and then more after that, it's a crucially important problem. And I don't know how we're going to solve it. I don't think anybody knows how we're going to solve that. That's a hard one. And the final one, final thing I want to talk about, just to close, is that of relevance. Because I'm talking about 20 year stuff, but maybe 20 years from now, we won't actually be using Linux at all. Maybe there will be something else that will come along. I put a quote here from Bruce Perrins who, thinks that, who thought five years ago that something was about to come along to supersede Linux. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but it's worth thinking about what could displace Linux from its place now. You know, some totally new way of programming or radically different hardware. I was running a panel with Andrew Morton in April and he suggested that we could maybe have a problem with, um, with say, commodity quantum computers, something like that, if somebody creates that. But he said, that in reality, if somebody creates a quantum computer that you can buy, the first thing they will do is they will put an x86 emulation layer on top of it, and then we will just be doing things as business as usual. Um, the other possible problem is, is the maneuverings of companies, corporate subterfuge, as I put it. And the key to that at this moment is the software patent battle, which is being carried out primarily but not exclusively in the United States. Software patents are a huge problem because the way that they have been done is such that you cannot write a program that does not infringe on many of them. And now people are starting to really make use of them to try to assure their success in the marketplace. It's going to be a big fight. It's going to go on for years. It's going to be ugly, but we have to solve this problem. We simply have to, or, um, or we're going to lose control over a whole lot of things. Something that I'm worried about. And with that, um, I'll finish on this note here. This is a quote from, <clears throat> from Linus on relevance. <clears throat> and he's saying that 
over the course of the last 40 years, which is about the history of Unix now, is about 40 years, the idea of a monolithic kernel written in C hasn't really changed a whole lot. The core ideas have not changed. And he doesn't really think that things are going to change much in the next 20 years either. And I kind of suspect that he is probably right. We can always be surprised. We have often have been in the past, we might be in the future. But I'd say that um, chances are in 20 years we'll still be talking about Linux and um, it'll still be going strong. And that is where I finish. I would be happy to answer any questions that people might have. If you have any questions, you can ask Chinese. I will help you. Can you speak your Okay, so the question is, will we have a Steve Jobs moment if at some point it looks like Linus Torvalds, you were talking about Linus, I assume, will no longer be maintaining the kernel? You know, if, if he were to decide not to do it, of course, I think he would arrange something orderly. If he were to, say, um, have a bad experience with a shark on one of his diving experiences, um, there would be a period of uncertainty, but I don't think that it would be that big of a problem. There are plenty of people who could step up to it. You know, he, in a sense, he doesn't do that much. He sits on top, he provides a lot of guidance, and um, he pushes back on things he doesn't like. But most of the process happens without him now. And we would do just fine at doing it without him in the future. I, I am not worried about that prospect at all. You know, it would be unfortunate to lose him but uh, we would recover from that. Nobody else? Over there. Um, just now you were mentioning about uh, retaining the controls of the hardware. So I was wondering why Linux haven't switched to GPL version 3. Because if Linux have switched to GPL version 3, then the bootloader locking on the Android devices nowadays would not have been possible. Yeah. All right, why has Linux not changed to GPL version 3? There are, there are two reasons for that. One is that the development community as a whole has decided that it doesn't like all of the requirements that can be found in version 3 of the, of the GPL, including the ones, the anti-DRM um, provisions that you, you mention here. That is considered to be a use of Linux, and, and we don't want to put limits on people can use Linux, even if we don't like all of the uses of Linux. So for that reason, there is no desire to do that. The other reason, though, is that there is no one person who owns the copyright to the Linux kernel. People who contribute to Linux retain their copyrights to it. So the Linux kernel has several thousand copyright holders at this point. Changing the license would require permission from all of those copyright holders. Those copyright holders are going to be hard to find. Some of them are, are dead. Some of them are in jail. Um, <laughs> many of them are simply not findable. And many of them are um, difficult. So it would be very, very hard to change the license of the kernel. And I would be surprised if that would happen. I think that only something that fundamentally compromised version 2 of the GPL could cause that to happen. Okay, well, if that's... Um, Actually, I have one last question. So. Okay, I also saw a hand back there. Is Linux a good model for other open source projects? Well, I think it has been a model for a lot of them. You know, a very clear example is if you look at how the x.org process has changed itself to look more like the kernel. But every project is different, and every project has to find its own way to do things. In terms of what I would change, I might change the way our community works sometimes. 
I think it can be hard to approach and hard to get into and, um, and resistant to, to ideas from certain directions at times. I wish we were better at that. I think the actual process works fairly well. All right, last question. So if one day you decide to, rec to retire, where will we get the high quality documentation available on LWN.net? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I can't retire. Uh -uh. <laughs> but I, I believe that that too, you know, there are needs that every community has. And you know, if somebody steps up and does it, then people are often happy to sit back and let them do it. When the need arises, somebody else steps up and things happen. So I suspect that people would do that too. I, I think they would. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all. 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 Thank you all.